Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brain Map. This seminar series is co sponsored by P41 funded Center for Mass Scale Mapping, housed in the Marshall Center. It is our great pleasure to have Dr. Efra Shimron today. Efra Shimron is a researcher in the field of computational MRI. Her research focuses on developing compressed sensing and AI techniques for accelerated MRI. Additionally, she investigated bias of AI algorithms. Her work on identifying data crimes in medical AI was published in Proceedings of National Academic Science, PNAS. Efrat works, Efrat work received a line of awards and she was named a rising star in electric engineering and computational com computer science. Efrat is currently a postdoc fellow at UC Berkeley working with Professor Mac Michael Lusty in October 2023, she will be open up her lab in Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Efra will join the Technion with the dual affiliation with the Department of Electric, Electric, Electrical and Computer Engineering and Biomedical Engineering. And her lab will be dedicated to computational medical imaging. Thank you everyone for joining us today and please address your question at the end of the talk. Hey, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to be here. And uh, thanks for the introduction for organizing this. And let's get started. So I'm going to tell you today about, well, about my work, uh, which ranges from data crimes to development of self-supervised advanced AI techniques for MRI. So let's get started. Uh, this is a little bit about myself. I grew up in Israel. Uh, I'm from Haifa, from the north of Israel. You can see the Technion campus in the upper photo. And I have four degrees from the Technion. And um, I'm also currently a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, as, as uh, Kieran mentioned. And I'm on my way back to Israel to open my lab at the Technion next, uh, next month. OK. So let's get started, although I know that many of you are currently familiar with MRI and you're doing a lot of work in this field, but just a brief motivation, why work on MRI? MRI is an exciting modality. It is safe. It, it has no ionizing radiation. It offers rich contrasts and it offers the ability to see both structure and function of the human body. But MRI also has some limitations, as I'm sure you know. First, the long scan duration. It can take minutes to acquire one image and up to one hour to scan per square subject. This leads to motion issues. People move during scans, they breathe, this creates blurring and motion artifacts. And it makes MRI very complicated because we need to ask subjects to do threshold. And if they can do that, especially young children, then we need to administer anesthesia, which carries its own risk. And on top of all of that, MRI is not, is not a, uh, it's very expensive. So it's not really accessible, not as accessible as CT, ultrasound, X ray, and other imaging modalities. So my aim, and I know that one of your aims too, is to make MRI a more widely accessible technology to bring it to large populations. Here's another technology that was not so accessible two decades ago, right? Phones went from this to this to this, and now it's a smart, personalized, and highly accessible technology. And I believe that MRI will go down the same path. Today we have those amazing scanners, but they have limited accessibility. But we're seeing the emergence of a new generation of scanner. Whoops, why is this not working? Let me just flip it here. Okay, my laptop is thinking about it. So I'll tell you in the meantime. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure you're familiar with Matt's work and the low field MRI technology, which is much, uh, much cheaper, right? And therefore much more accessible. It doesn't require high sighting, uh, special facilitating and so, uh, so on much much more accessible it's also portable if you're talking about a hyperfine scanner and i wish i could show you the next step don't know what's happening here wait for a second what need to clear it. Okay. oh here we go yeah you got stuck but anyway this is the hyperfine scanner which i believe you all know and i believe that in a few years from now maybe a decade from now when we will go to our doctor in our own local clinic there will be a scanner right there and then and if we'll feel bad, the doctor will give us an MRI scan at every local clinic, just like today we have x-rays in all clinics. But in order to get there, 
we still need to solve some challenges. There's still a way to go. And today I'm going to uh, show you my work of how I'm working towards developing new methods that will solve some of these challenges. So what are the key challenges that we're talking about? So first, we need trustable AI techniques. AI or artificial intelligence, as you probably know, is everywhere today. The most powerful algorithms are based on AI, and it's helpful for accelerating scans and for improving the image quality. But if you look at this vision of mine, you will notice that there is no radiology school, right? We want to be able to train every doctor in every local clinic to be an expert in radiology. Such training takes many years, so that's not going to happen. So if those AI algorithms are going to be implemented in those scanners, we must be able to trust them. We need to know that the algorithms are doing what they think that they do, and that they're reliable. And I'm going to tell you today about my work in this field. Secondly, we need fast imaging. We can't continue to have one hour scans per subject. You know, it's not, we can't work like that. And we need motion robust MRI. We need to overcome some of those motion artifacts in order to improve the image quality. So I want to give you just a really quick uh, overview of the basics of MRI, just in case somebody here is not familiar with it. Just a couple of slides and that's it to make sure we are on the same page. So here's a very simple overview of the MRI pipeline. As you probably know, it begins from the scanner. We have a subject residing in the scanner. We acquire data from that subject. And the signal that we acquire over time gives us one line in the Fourier transformer in the Fourier space of the image, which is also called K. So if we acquire the data following the Nyquist sampling criterion, then we can reconstruct images using the inverse Fourier transform. And that's very simple. However, this, this type of sampling is slow, it takes a very long time. So a very common approach to accelerate scans is by undersampling k space by collecting less data. And now we need image reconstruction algorithms. We can no longer use the simple inverse Fourier transform to reconstruct images because that will give us severe artifacts. And of course, this is a field of active research. Many techniques have been developed, starting from parallel imaging techniques uh, to compressed sensing techniques, and more, most recently, machine learning techniques. They currently, we're seeing many methods in this field, and they're giving state of the art results. So going back to this list of key challenges, let's start with the first one, which is trustable AI. And now I'd like to tell you about my work in this film, which is titled Data Crimes. The data crimes is the research that I did in order to highlight some of the problems in this field and how simple research methodologies could lead us to results that are misleadingly good and actually bad. And in order to explain this, I'd like to start with describing a very common research pipeline. Many, many studies on researchers uh, in the field use this pipeline, and I'm sure you will be familiar with it. So the pipeline begins from fully sampled case space data. Let's say that you or somebody else is developing a new reconstruction algorithm. How do you go about and prove the algorithm? So what is often done is to undersample the data retrospectively, and then to apply the reconstruction algorithm. And then this gives us the reconstructed uh, image. In order to prove that our algorithm is obtaining accurate results, what we usually do is to compare this reconstructed image with the gold standard image using our metrics, which is normalized using QL or structural similarity. This gold standard image is obtained from fully sampled case space data, and that's why we need those fully sampled case space data. The problem is that fully sampled case space data is difficult to obtain from all the due to all the problems that we talked about earlier, motion, scan down, cost, and so on. So what do you do when you want to develop a new AI technique? You need thousands of examples, right? You can't just have one or two. It's too expensive and often impossible to acquire them in the lab. So what do you do? A simple solution that many people do is to go online, they Google MRI data, and they find some database and they download it. And then if you do that, you will see that many databases contain MR images, not case piece data, but images. So what would you do if you have an image and you need its case piece? What would you do? For a simple solution is to yeah. FP, thank you, Matt. So you will apply the first Fourier transform and synthesize case piece data. Now this is commonly done. It's a, it's a walk around. Many people do. Now what's the problem? And you, and you base your research on that. The problem is that images that are found in online databases, remember these are images, they're often pre-processed using hidden data pre-processing pipelines. Those pipelines Pipelines are black boxes. Nobody knows what's going on inside, and many times the details are not on the website. They're simply ignored. 
Why does that happen? Because many many databases, for example, databases on, that are found on drives or other schedule and so on, offer those images for downstream tasks, such as segmentation, classification, bar marker extraction, and so on. For that downstream tasks, it's okay to pre-process the data. Those algorithms come later. But the problem is that sometimes those data, data sets are taken and used for synthesizing case free data and for evaluation of reconstruction algorithms. And that's a problem because those data sets have been proportioned. Some data sets do offer raw case free data, but those are very, very few. And the data is limited, it's mainly near and brain data. And so what I found is that when people take those data sets and use them for reconstruct development of reconstruction algorithms, it le leads to biased results. But not just biased, it leads to fantastic, good looking results. And what do people do when they get fantastic results? What do we do in academia? We publish. That's what we're there for, right? That's what we're doing. And so many methods are coming up with bias results simply because the workflow was not designed correctly. You know, because this type of workflow, it seems okay, right? Because this is MRI data and you use it for MRI purposes, but really it leads to bias results. And so now I'd like to share- Can, can I just ask a question? Sure. So when I read your paper, you know, and many conversations over the years, to me, the biggest data crime was really about like image compression things, you know, JPEG things, et cetera, et cetera. Now that I see this slide, it seems like you're talking about things including like oil combination. Yes. And and all like the many, 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 many things that we do, yeah. which we're basically piling on assumptions of ground truth accuracy, you know. And and so it's so it's not just about image compression. Right. It's it's about all this other stuff. That's an excellent oh. comment. I'm going to demonstrate that in my next oh, cool. Thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Well, yeah, there's a million, right? There's a million things, right? <laughs> Or like a like a right MS Robert Diffusion program or all kinds of things. Right. All right, Sorry. let me move forward. So exactly, this is exactly what I'm showing. So now I'd like to show you one example for such a hidden data reprocessing pipeline. This pipeline is implemented inside commercial MRI scanners. All of them. So if you have a Siemens GE Philips scanner, the scanner itself, the software of the scanner is being used. So what's going on under the hood? The scanner acquires the data with a multicolor array. Then it often applies zero padding by default, by default. Then it, uh, it will have the color dimension, so it applies some form of color combination, just like you said. Right. So many times this could be doing some restraint operation. I mean, this is a lossy operation, right? Because here we had complex value data, and now we have magnitude only data, single channel instead of multi channel, right? So already some of the information was lost. But because this is the image that you see on the screen when you do an MRI scan, it's considered a legitimate image. And so it's often stored in an online database, right? And so later, somebody else could come and download this, that, that database and that new person would not know that the data was pre-processed and it would just take this image and apply it for a transform to it. Yeah, you did not hear me on Zoom? Yeah. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to stay here. Okay, also use my mouse so that they can... Look, see. So as you can see, so this is the pipeline that is implemented inside the scanner. But now when you take the image and you apply the forward for a transform to it, you get artificial data in areas that were previously empty. There was nothing here. So why do we see data here? This is synthetic noise. It's a result of this entire pipeline, especially of the root sum of squares operation. But many people don't realize that this is not real data. And because the case space looks full, they go and undersample the data retrospectively. Now, that's one problem. The other problem is that the type of masks that there is usually used in our field is variable density masks, which sample the center of K-space more densely than the periphery, because we know that the energy is mostly concentrated in K-space center. But now look what happens. The original K-space data that was here was now squashed to the center due to the zero padding. So as a result, the original data are being sampled with a very high rate much more than a researcher would plan or would report in a paper. So sometimes you would see a paper come out that could report maybe an acceleration factor of 10, but actually it could be two or three, you see? Because, and this is done very naively because people don't understand what is really happening, okay? So now, 
So, and I did experiments, the details are in the paper. I'm not going to go to all the technical experiments, but I, what I showed in the paper is that if you undersample the data in this way, you can get an, an acceleration of six or four, you know, no, you would report six, but actually it's 2.5. So that's really, 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 you know, you're giving your algorithm a lot of true data and any algorithm is going to do very well, especially because the images are magnitude only. So you only need to sample half of case space. And so any algorithm can perform amazingly well here. So sometimes this improvement would be uh, attributed to the new loss function or a new architecture or a new network or something, but actually it could be because the data is pre-processed. So my main message here is be very careful with how you use data and how you plan your working uh, methodology, your workflow. And now let me show you some of the experiments that I did. So what I did was to take the FastMRI database, which is raw, it offers raw multi-coil data, and to implement the pipeline that I just showed you. And I generated five versions of that data set. This is uh, the original without processing, and these all of them are coil combined. And this is here from left to right, the pre-processing extent grows up to twofold. And then I implemented three different algorithms, compressed sensing, dictionary learning, and deep learning. And I measured how the error changes with the pre-processing extent. And here you see two experiments and you see the same phenomenon. The more the data is pre-processed, the lower the error becomes. So the algorithm performs better and better. This is compressed sensing. Here's dictionary learning, same results. Here's deep learning, same results. You see the same trend. So someone could get results that are up to 40% better compared with another paper, and they could attribute it to the architecture or something, but actually it could be due to the data pre-processing. So what I, what I showed here in this research is that naive use of big data could lead to biased results in very common scenarios. This is all happening you know, naively. It seems okay, but it isn't. And there's another issue here which you should be uh, careful. Error metrics, are actually blind to the pre-processing. Why isn't this metric telling us here that the algorithm is actually performing poorly? Why are we seeing such good metrics? The reason is that the metrics are measured between the reconstructed image and the so-called gold standard image. But this isn't really the gold standard, is it? It's actually based on the same synthesized case space data. So the error metric cannot measure the true quality of the data because we don't have the original data. So therefore it becomes blind to this entire phenomenon. So then after I did this research, I, I started uh, talking about this in that environment. So and people asked me, how, well, how will the algorithms perform for clinical data? You know, let's say you train your algorithm on a database that you download it. Is it going to do well now for raw case-based data? So I did this experiment uh, in order to test that. And I it took the networks that were trained on processed data and now did inference twice on processed and non-processed data. So for processed data, the results are pretty good. But now for non-processed data, we get blurring. Why does that happen? What do you think? It's because those algorithms now face a distribution shift, right? Because they've been adapted to processed data. And now when they're given real data where the case space is no longer in the center, it's spread all over the place, they, they don't perform so well. And this graph shows this uh, statistically and you can see the difference here. So in the, in the data crime scenario, the error is very low, but now for real world data, the error is quite high, almost double, right? So what do you mean by non-process in this case? Is it just no zero? Non-zero pilot, yeah, but still call combined. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it would, of course, perform even more poorly for non coil combined data, right? Because right? it's already, adapted. I think we have to do this research. I, yeah, we have to do that. We have to answer that question. But okay. the main point is that there's now a distribution shift between those two scenarios. And here I also show that some clinically important details that show a meniscus, a torn meniscus, they could completely disappear. And so this, this could be potentially harmful if somebody implements it, you know, uncareful in the clinic. And so we have to be really very careful at how we evaluate the performance of AI algorithms, how we train them, how we test them, and how we evaluate them. That's the main message. So I'm going to skip over this due to the uh, time. Uh, just to say our paper was published last year in PNAS, and all of our current and pre-trained models are given here. And if anybody is interested in doing follow-up work, I know that uh, Reinhard Heckel's group has already done a very interesting follow-up paper and walk, and the paper is about to come out. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, reach out. I'll be happy to chat with you. 
Okay. So let's say that you want to develop a new imaging technique, so let's say for dynamic MRI, but you just can't find suitable data sets. There's no public data set. How do you go about it? It's very difficult, especially for dynamic body imaging, where the acquisition is in inherently too slow. You just can't sample all of case space. You have to deal with partial data. There's not enough time to sample everything. How do you solve this problem? So that's what I'm going to talk about now. I would like to introduce our next method, our, the, a method that I developed recently at Berkeley with my team, which is titled k -band. So here are, I just want to acknowledge uh, two wonderful students that I was lucky to mentor, mentor Han Chi and Fred Wang. They're the first co-authors of this work. And Han Chi is actually coming here to Harvard for her PhD. Fred is continuing in Berkeley for a master's degree. Okay. So now we want to develop a new deep learning technique for dynamic MRI. And our, our paper, by the way, just came out in archive two weeks ago. So I'm very excited about it. So ideally, what you would want to do here is to sample all of K space again and again over time, but there's not enough space, not enough time. So what we propose is to sample only a band. You see, we, we limit resolution in one phase encoding dimension only abandon, we sample that again and again over time. This is fast, right? But it leads to limited resolution data. You have high resolution in this dimension, the readout, but limited resolution in phase encoding dimension. Is this good? Let's say that you acquire data from one subject at the hospital and the data looks like this. And from every subject, let's say that we can acquire only one data set because we inject a contrast agent and we can't repeat that. Now here comes another subject, and we are going to acquire, a, again, only a band of case space, but it, this time in a different orientation in case space, a different part of case space. It's a different person, okay? So a different body. And now here comes a third subject, and we will acquire, again, only a band in case space. Is this useful? Can we train neural networks using only such limited resolution data and still obtain the same performance as if we trained on fully sampled case space? The answer is yes, and this is the method. This is KBAN. Let me walk you through the steps. So let's start with the training data acquisition. Now we're going to build a new database. As I said, from every subject, we acquire only one band, but we change the orientation randomly such that across all the subjects, we will cover all of case space. And if we have a subject population that is big enough, eventually our data set will cover all of case space. Okay. Then we take every band, and we train a network in a self-supervised manner. We take the band, we undersample it retrospectively here using a variable density mask, and the network will construct a band. Now, K-band is agnostic to the architecture. You can, you can implement it with different architectures. Here we used an animal network, physics-guided network. This is the, based on the MODL implementation. So the network reconstructs only the band, and we compute the loss in K-space by comparing the reconstructed band to the acquired band. So we do this and we apply supervision only within the band. And we don't apply any supervision outside the band because we, not, we want the network, the net, we don't want to enforce zeros here. We want the network to learn correlations in all of case space because for the next subject, which will come in in the next training iteration, it will see a different band, right? So we want to learn those ways for all of case space. So the supervision is limited to the band, okay? This is a new approach. But if you think about it, all the samples that we give the network contain the center of case space. So there is a risk that the network might develop a bias towards accurate estimation of the center, right? Be and might neglect the periphery because if it reconstructs the center accurately, then on average, it will always be correct and it will get a high loss value. But that's not what we want it to do because it's going to get the center anyway because all the samples contain it. We actually want it to learn the periphery. So in order to facilitate accurate reconstruction of high frequency data, we introduce a new loss weighting mask. And by the way, we derive this whole network analytically and we give the whole proof in the, in the paper. I'm not gonna take you through all the mathematical details, but it's there. And so this mask, which we derived is actually very simple to calculate. It's one over all the masks, binary masks that contain the bands. So as, you, as you can see, this mask, which we use to multiply the loss in case space, it inhibits the values of the loss in the center of case space, and it places more emphasis on the uh, values of the loss in the periphery. So using this, we enforce the network to learn the peripheral areas of case space. Okay, any questions about this? 
Yeah. So uh, this is input data there, you have case speed data, and then you this reconstructed data, you also have case speed data, or like the top of the network? Yeah. It doesn't matter. The network can output an image and you can take it to case space using the Fourier transform. Did I answer the question? Okay, so, so you start with the image, you take a K, you produce a K band from the image? No, no, no. We sample only. So here we simulate bands based on the fast and right database. But ideally in the clinic, you would sample only a band. Okay. And you give, you take the band, you apply the inverse Fourier transform, you get the image, and you give that to the network. And the, the network then is. Has to figure the full case space. Uh, yeah, it needs to learn. Yeah. Uh, the full uh, case space. Yeah, we put zeros outside the band and we give that to the network. No, but there's zeros here. Maybe I should have put a square around this to make it clearer. Well, yeah, you said, it, the you said that it, you, you compute a loss function just looking at the band. Yeah, but the network gives all of case space. We sure. just don't do anything in terms of supervising. You, you will look at it, yes. Oh, no, I mean, we'll look at it visually. No, I mean, the network needs to output the full case space, right? I will, this is just training. Let me, I will talk about test yeah, time in a minute. Okay, the network needs to output the entire matrix of case space. Okay. We don't do anything uh, in terms of supervision outside the band. We supervise the band, okay. but we want it to do everything because for the next person, there will be a different band. Okay. So our supervision test changes. Time. What? Test time is not a band. No. Okay. So now, so now let, give me one second. Any other questions about this? Okay. So, okay. So this was training. Now I want to talk about test time. For testing, we do something slightly different. We acquire the data with an undersampled mask that covers the entire case space. So yes, so here we had limited resolution, fully sampled bands. So we had low resolution and no undersampling artifacts. Now we have high resolution with undersampling artifacts. We take this data and we do inference on the pre-trained network. And here comes the magic. We show that during test time, the network can generalize to high resolution reconstructions without any further training. Yes, it can. Yes, we can, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because the undersampling pattern is so, oh, so it's the same. It's the same statistics. Yeah, yeah, it's the I same. Think. It's the same statistics as we use during training. And but no issues with like, field of view or oh I no. see because you're building up the field of view over multiple shots right for multiple subjects right also uh, the network is fully convolutional so it can take an image of any size and it and you're doing mini batches of different uh orientations yes uh, okay every in fact every uh, subject is uh, we use only one band from each subject and in order to make sure that I told the students, what we did was to take those data sets, crop the bands before we even begin the training and save the masks with the data itself. Because there's a, there's a cell potential risk here for a crime because if you don't do that, then many, over many iterations, can, the network can sample different bands from the same image. We don't want that to happen. So for every subject, we defined one mask that is always used, one band. But just so I understand, the, yeah. the um, you, you are doing many batches Across different stuff because there's a loss function right there. Yeah. But that's combined with multiple orientations from different subjects, right? So for every what drives back. So what drives back prop is my question. The back prop is this. You you compute the loss here between the the. So it's not a mini batch. It's, it's not, not a mini batch. Oh. I mean, you can use mini batches during training, but basically yeah, yeah, during, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Training. Every training example has only one batch. Oh. You can you can use batches of ten just to make your updates more efficient, but those ten don't necessarily have the oh. same band. Okay. You can you compute the loss and you accumulate the loss value. So for every sample, it's a regional loss. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah, but you can accumulate the loss. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. You can, okay. You can so accumulate. Just because I'm thinking like, okay, so you have one slab, I don't know what you call it, one of these orientations, Band. you have your loss, yeah. you update the weights, then you have a different subject and right. a different orientation. But there's a mask here, let me, here, let me yeah, use yeah, the yeah. zoom annotation, there's, a, there's, there's the, full, the full matrix is here, is, okay. it is not shown, yeah, we'll put okay. it next time. Okay. Okay, you have the full case space, but you look at the... Your only, only yes, yes, only inside okay. the band, and we back propagate it. That's cool. So, 
Okay. And we have one more question from online audience. So yeah. yeah. The question was on slide 33. You mentioned that for adequate training data, the acquisition has to contain a sufficient number of bands. Have you investigated? Yes. How, how much yeah. is sufficient? That's a great question. So we haven't done all the analysis of how much is sufficient. We did train with different number of batches. We found that if you go to a thousand examples and beyond, the statistics doesn't change. And also what we did investigate was how narrow the band can be. So there's a trade-off here, right? If you have wide bands, you need a small number of patients or subjects. If the bands are very narrow, you will need more subjects in order to cover more all of case space, right? And so what we show in the paper, all the results are on archive, is that you can go up to very narrow bands, even one over 10 from the network size, and the performance does not change. K-band is super, super stable with respect to band size, number of population, number of subjects, and uh, we try different loss functions. Uh, it's super stable, super stable results. We did it both for brain and need data from fast MRI. Okay, and one Thank last one is, have you ever investigated this under different acquisition conditions? Uh, what, what would be different acquisition <laughs> conditions? Please give us an example. Yeah. Those, those are the main experiments that we did. Are there single slices? Um, it's multi slice data from uh, oh, well, you said that. Fast so, MRI. So the band is, yeah, that's right. The band is multi. Is, is is, yeah, but no, but here from every slice, we acquire a different band. Yeah. Because we use fast MRI. But ideally, you we would we do want to do that with 3D imaging. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, the motivation for all of this is because you can augment the lecture the day. No. Because, like, you can do so you scan time scan yes. time yeah, that's the motivation yeah but you can also augment i mean you can have 10 times more subjects yes yes yeah since you're right you're training on your own case base right right but the main motivation is really scan time but this method was developed from the understanding that in the, in the applications like dynamic mri you just can't sample everything so we wanted to develop a method that can use only partial case space data and could be trained with that and, and but you're correct in the sense that this is kind of a data augmentation approach. If we only acquired the same time, the same band over and over again, it would be a less augmentation. By the way, we did that experiment also. But after you train it, then you acquire the mask is like not based on the K band, it's based right. on the full case space. Right. Okay. Yeah. And Any other question? We speak to the audience just add a more comment. So like different acquisition means different resolution or scanner or SNL level or on events. So okay. So the, the let me answer the end. The, in terms of different scanners, the fast array database does contain images from different scanners. That's so true. also different field strengths, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's in there, it's inside. Uh, what what were the other things? Yeah, resolutions. resolutions with um so if you think about it, the band size is directly related to the resolution, right? So the answer is yes. We we try different resolutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I have to move forward. Thank you for the questions, everybody, both in Zoom and in the room. Uh, let me move forward and I'll be happy to take more questions in the end. Okay, so here are some of result of the results that I'm most proud of. There's plenty more in the paper. So on the left, you see the ground truth image. Here you see MODL, which is a well-known fully supervised method. Here you see SSDU, which is a state-of-the-art self-supervised method, and you see K-band. Let me uh, close it. And now you can see that they obtained exactly the same results. There's no difference whatsoever. Even though these two methods were trained on data with high resolution, while K-band is trained on data with four times lower resolution. So you see that it obtains exactly the same performance, both in the images and both in the error maps. See? Okay, so you could tell me, okay, yeah, but this is one example. Can you show us some statistics? So here are the statistics. So this is SS, the SSIM matrix. So one's, one means perfect reconstruction. And here you see MODL, SSDU, K square, and K vertical, which are two other methods that are trained only on bands. All the details are in the paper. And here you see that when we compare K band with those methods that are trained only on limited resolution data, it outperforms both of them statistically. And it performs comparably to these two methods that were trained on high resolution data. You see, this is statistical um, evaluation. So as I said, we have the full mathematical proof in the paper, we derived it. And what we showed is that 
we we full we give a proof that k band stochastically approximates training with fully sampled k space data. So on average, we converge to the same result, which is what you see here in this graph. And also, uh, it's super easy to implement. You can implement k band on any scanner. The only thing you, that you need to do is to reduce the resolution in the phase encoding dimension, which is one parameter to change, and you can manually rotate. The, the band direction, and that's it. You got yourself a band. And if you do it over enough subjects, you will get a new database. So this is ideal for leveraging dead time between scans. If your subject is on the table for a full hour and you have one minute between scans, you can run this and then eventually build a new database for many subjects. OK, any questions about this? OK, I think, I think we had enough questions. Yeah, I, I would say I'd love to see the comparison against K-band trained on data crimes. So if you took oh my gosh. The, the <laughs> insight, yeah, like, like if you took your high resolution fully sampled data and then subsampled it. Well, that's what it would perform. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that later yeah. from what David's doing. Yep, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah, data carbon and data crimes. I didn't think about that yet. <laughs> okay. Uh let's move forward. Okay. So we talked about data crimes, we talked about k and I would like to take a, a few minutes to discuss motion robust MRI. I'm going to run over some of the slides here because we spent a lot of time on K-band, okay? So my uh, research here is titled BladeNet, and BladeNet is a method for abdominal imaging for diagnosis of IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. This is a collaboration with leading radiologists from Stanford Children's Hospital. So in abdominal, especially abdominal pediatric imaging, when, the, when we want to assess a, IBD, we want to see two things. First, the structure of the balls. For that, we need high spatial resolution. Secondly, the function of the balls. Of course, this is an animation. For that, then we need high temporal resolution. And for both of them, we need motion robustness. We need the subject to stop, stop moving. But do we have that? Mm -mm, not yet. This is from Stanford Children's Hospital. You can see that we have a um, low spatial resolution, low temporal resolution, and everything is moving. The subject is breathing, the heart is beating, the balls are moving. This is super challenging, right? Everything's moving while we are acquiring the data slowly. So we wanted to develop an AI technique or a reconstruction technique to deal with that. And then I'm sure you know there are many techniques out there in the literature that have dealt with motion, right? And so sometimes I get asked the question of why didn't you just take one of those techniques, for example, XD grasp and apply it here or compress sensing and so on. The answer is that many of those techniques assume either periodic motion, for example, for the heart or for respiration or rigid body motion, for example, for the head. But this is none, none of this. This is non-rigid, non-periodic motion. Here is an example from motion artifacts. So this is a super challenging imaging problem. So how did we go about and develop a method for this? So we realized that peristalsis imaging has a very special feature. Motion is localized in space and time. When one image patch is moving, others are still, because that's how the balls move. So we wanted to develop a re acquisition reconstruction technique that will enable us to reconstruct every patch independently across the temporal dimension, time dimension, while separating information between patches in order not to mix them, okay? So which acquisition strategies could we use that will enable us time-dependent reconstruction? So here's the full case piece and here's the IFT image. We could use Cartesian variable density, but it leads to global artifacts. We could use radial, but it also leads to global artifacts. So here information is different, is being mixed across the image. That's not good for our aim. It's okay for other aims, not for this one. So then I decided to use propeller sample. Propeller is great for this end because it has two advantages. If you take the IFT of each blade, you will see that there's local only artifacts and it also offers useful information for motion correction. So here is just uh, to give you a taste of it. If you take single blade images or if you use the linear pro traditional propeller method, you will see that the results are blurry. If you use my technique, which I called blade net, you, you will see the results become sharp. Here's the architecture of the network. But how did I train this, ne this network? I just told you there is no suitable database, right? So how do you train it? So what I did was to develop my own database, and this is still work in progress. And what I did was to acquire data I, uh, from subjects. And for that, I programmed the propeller sequence and the BSSFP sequence, sorry, the propeller trajectory with the BSSFP balanced steady state free precession. 
sequence and I deploy this on the GE3T scanner that we have at Berkeley. And then I scan 23 adult volunteers and I build a new database of approximately 3,000 3, frames. And the way I designed it is that I acquired full rotating case space data. Why? I need the full data for supervising the network and I needed the rotation for chemical shift effect. And then I cropped the blades retrospectively. So from each case space, I took one blade and I use those blades to fit the network. The network receives a series of images, a dynamic series, and it outputs also a dynamic series. But by leveraging the correlations between them, the network can reconstruct almost the full case space, all the data that is covered within the propeller trajectory. And we computed the loss uh, in this area. So let me show you some results. These are preliminary results. So here's the input. Here's the blade net output. These are from subsample data from the propeller blades. And here's the target from the fully sampled case space data. So first you will see that the subject is uh, breathing freely, right? We did not ask for them to do any breath holds. And you can also see that blade net outputs uh, images with less artifacts compared with the input. But of course, there's still some problems with the data because we chose the SSFP sequence. There's a lot of chemical shift effects around here. There's gas, uh, tissue gas interfaces. So we have a lot of uh, of resonance problems, and there's also bonding artifacts due to SS, the SSFP sequence. But generally, it shows the potential of this method where you see that there is less artifacts with blindness. And then well, I also did perspective evaluation. So because earlier the, the training data was fully sampled, right? So it slows down the acquisition. But now I acquired only blades. So this is much faster. And I just did inference on the network. And you can see the results. There's no ground truth here because we didn't acquire the full data. And again, you see, you know, this is five times, uh, three times faster than the previous example. And again, you can see that BladeNet output, outputs a video that, is, that has less artifacts compared with the input. And this is still work in progress. Uh, we published this at the SMRM last year, and we're still uh, working on developing this method, for example, for other sequences. Okay, so that was BladeNet. I'd like to take one, two minutes to talk about my collaboration with Matt in the field of exciting field of low cost imaging. And so, as uh, you know, Hyperfine is now uh, a mature technology that was FDA cleared three years ago that created a lot of excitement in our field. And here you see how um, a scanner can be rolled to the patient from bedside imaging. And now we're seeing a lot of papers, conferences, a recent nature review. And so on. this is really a very active field of research because I think that our community understands the huge potential in this technology for making it making MRI widely accessible. And now these days there's a whole range of low field scanner uh, in, in this uh, field strength and uh, they're low cost and some of them are also portable. But the, the low magnetic field also comes with a lower scenario, of course, low signal to noise ratio and with limited contrast. These are some of the challenges in this technology. And so as part of my collaboration with Matt, we're developing a, a acquisition reconstruction techniques in order to improve this image quality. And this is work that is done with David Waddington, who I know used to be here, and now he's a researcher at the Sydney, the University of Sydney. So just to give you a little bit of results that we obtained, this is from our uh, 2022 ISMRM abstract. In 2022, we wanted to optimize the sampling pattern for fixed scan time. So what we did was take data from Matt's scan, 6.5 milli Tesla scanner with the sample with the SSFP sequence. And we tried for fixed scan time to see what's better to do full sampling with some number of averages, for example, 16, or to do under sampling to accelerate by twofold and to, re to increase the number of re repetitions by twofold. So here we have more uh, repetitions, more next, uh, higher next. And, what you, and then we applied compressed sensing for the reconstruction. As you can see, the results are equivalent and compressed sensing obtains slightly better error metrics, SSAM and NMC. So we, uh, our conclusion was that it's good to undersample the data and uh, apply compressed sensing because you will get slightly better image quality. And here are some more results. And so in this, uh, in the recent uh, ASMRM in Toronto, we presented a comparison also with two deep learning architectures. First is AutoMap, which also came from Matt's group, and there a more recent unrolled network. So here again, we attempted to optimize both the sampling pattern and the reconstruction 
quality and there's more details in the abstract. I won't go into everything. But what you can see is that compressed sensing obtains slightly sharper results here. You see the edge of this phantom, so that it's better with compressed sensing. And AutoMap and the Unroll network obtains more details around here. So we're, we're still investigating that. What we found, we reached an interesting conclusion. Yeah, sorry, these are the references. And so our conclusion was as follows. We noticed that AutoMap and the Unroll networks get a higher SSAM and NRMC metrics. But we also noticed that this improvement over compressed sensing mostly comes from suppression of background noise. So the annual networks were really good at suppressing the background, the black background around the phantom or the brain, but we're less interested in that, right? So then we masked the background. And after we did that, we realized that compressed sensing and deep learning actually perform equivalently. So this is very interesting. So again, this shows that our metrics are not always that reliable. It connects to the data crimes work where my, my main message is be very careful with how you use our metrics, how they're measured, what are you measuring? And always, always look at the data. It will always get you more interesting insights. All right. So that was my walk. And I'd like to show you very, very briefly in one slide what my future lab will be about. I'm excited to share with you that I'm opening my lab next month at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. And so my aim and vision is to make MRI smart, personalized, and highly accessible technology. And my future lab will continue to develop computational MRI techniques. So our first the research direction will be still dynamic motion robust MRI. And here I am to develop techniques for data challenging regimes. These are all the regimes that we talked about where motion is abundant, where there's not enough time to sample all of case space, especially body imaging. And here, this is already work uh, that I'm doing with my students in Berkeley, where we're developing a self-supervised motion estimation and correction technique, which is completely self-supervised, does not need any ground truth motion fields, you can extract them from the unresampled data. The second direction will be personalized healthcare. We want to develop alarm raising systems for longitudinal monitoring for wide screening in the community. And here I'm very excited about using both high field and low field imaging for doing screening and raising alarms when the system detects that something suspicious is going on. The last direction will be point of care imaging. And here I am to establish motion robust AI methods, especially for neonatal imaging where imaging is so difficult because babies move, they cannot be sedated, their contrast changes. There's a lot of challenges here related to neonatal imaging. I think that this is exciting and fascinating to develop new techniques for neuroscience, especially in the developing brain. So I'd like to summarize by acknowledging all the fantastic team that I was lucky to work with. Over the last few years, few years Mickey Lustig and the team at Berkeley, Shreyas Vasanawala, the team at Stanford, Matt Horizon, and his group here, David Waddington, Andrew Webb, and John Tamir. I didn't have time to speak about my work with them. John was a part of the data crimes team and my wonderful team of students in Berkeley. And these are my funding sources. And uh, as I said, I'm going to open a lab. I have students, I have funding for hiring new folks. So if you're interested, maybe that could be you joining our team. Uh, if you're looking for your next career step, whether it's a master's or PhD or postdoctoral, postdoctoral stage and you want to experience some of the exciting life abroad, then please come and chat with me. I'll be happy to, happy to know you. Thank you everyone for your time and attention.